صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله صلى الله عليك يا يا عبرة المؤمنين يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا بايب نجايت الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات I begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most gracious, the most merciful, the Lord who created you and I in utmost perfection through His infinite mercy. For if you were to travel the world and try to find any human being, rather any creature, that came close to the creation of the human being, you wouldn't be able to find. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes that clear, الَّذِي أَحْسَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَ وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمٍ We have created mankind in the best of structures. And that's why you find, for example, Star Trek, this movie Star Trek, as much as they build creatures, and as much as they come up with new inventions of creatures here and there, you find the more they mess around with the creatures, creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the uglier it looks. Because as beautiful a human being is, you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have created you beautiful. And if you were to mess around with it, you're not going to be more beautiful, you're just going to be less beautiful. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through His infinite mercy, created you and I in the best of fashions. And this is indeed a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For if there was a blessing that you and I should thank Allah for, with all honesty I speak, it's the fact that He has given us existence. هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينُ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُرًا Allah says you are nothing. Meaning you are nothing. You came from nothing. And there is no reason for me to bring you to existence except, alaykum salam wa except for me to express my mercy to you. And if we had a sense of morality inside of us, or even a sense of decency, we would sit down and realize this concept. We would say, I had no reason to be created. I never did a favor to Allah. I never gave him anything. I never signed a contract with him. But because of his infinite mercy, he created you and I and sent us to this universe. This is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one who has decreed upon himself mercy. The previous nights, we have been covering various issues which pertain to the individual. The previous four nights, we've been speaking about issues which pertain to you and I on an individual level. Issues like, for example, how man is the only human or the only creation has been given potential to represent Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this earth. وَعَدَ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ The criteria for me to be the representative of Allah on this earth is what? Faith. Because what differentiates me what deciphers me from every other human being is the fact that I have the ability to have this spiritual dimension. I mentioned how an animal perceives the world only through its external senses. An animal. What do I mean? It's limited to its physical desires. Limited to eating, sleeping, drinking, mating. It doesn't have this ability that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us to penetrate through things intellectually, spiritually. When an animal sees, for example, a tree, 
or sees another creature, he's not thinking, SubhanAllah, Allah has created such beautiful creation. He says, how can I eat it? How can I get it? How can I benefit from it? Yet the human being has been created so beautifully and has been given this aql, this intellect, that no other human being has been given for this reason. So that when I see something, I don't simply stop at the physical dimension, no. When I see it, I link Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to it. يَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ They think about the creations of the skies and earth. Do they stop there? No. رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلًا سُبْحَانَكَ فَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ After I looked at this physical nature in front of me, I didn't stop at the physical realm. I linked it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because I have been created not only with body, but with soul. An animal is body, no soul. Angel is soul, no body. Human being is the only creation that Allah has created. That's a mixture of body and soul. Notice. Notice the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet all of this rahmah and all of this blessings that Allah has given man, He's trying to send you a message. A profound message. Telling you, I created you differently from every, every, every other human being for a reason. Because unlike the animal, the human being has a purpose on this earth. Many of us are heedless of his purpose, and I point fingers to myself first. We walk around, we'll go to school, we'll get a nice degree, we'll financially be stable, this is all excellent. Yet everything should be a mean to that goal that Allah has created us for. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ A brother was asked the question yesterday, he asked me, he said, Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah hasn't created neither jinn or ins except so that may worship me. Does this mean I should stay in my room 24-7 and worship Allah day and night? Is this what Islam came to bring? No. But this term of ibadah has such a general sense that everything can be considered ibadah. Everything. What do I mean? Imam Amir al-Mu'min Ali ibn Abi Talib, what does he tell? He tells Abba Dhar. He tells him, Ya Abba Dhar, إِذَا اسْتَطَعْتَ أَن تَجْعَلْ أَكْلَكَ وَشُرْبَكَ قُرْبَةً إِلَى اللَّهِ تَعَالَى فَفْعَلُونَ He says, if you're able to make even your eating and drinking for the sake of Allah, do it. What does he mean? He say, Imam, I'm relaxing, I'm eating my hamburger, it tastes so good, you want me to link it to Allah, even my food? What do you mean? What does the Quran say? He says, فَلْيَنْظُرُ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ Let the human being ponder upon his food. What does this mean? Yes, my physical food. Where did this blessings come from? It's a very simple sense, it's a very simple concept, but very few of us adapt it and incorporate it in our daily lives. Everything I do can be a ibadah. Is there any greater blessing than that? I'm walking, it's a ibadah. How? Through my intention. I say, I'm walking, yes. I'm going from point A. For example, I'm going from my house to my university. Even that can be ibadah. How? I say, I'm going to university. Why? So that I can be educated and through an education has been set as something by the Holy Prophet himself. Or for example, I'm going to the gym. People say, I'm going to the gym. You still want me to remember Allah? Even in the gym, you're following me even to the gym? I'm going to the gym. I'm working out. I'm going to have a good time. What does Allah say? He says, you're going to the gym. Yes, excellent. Have a good workout. Have a good sweat. You yeah, have in mind, for example, I'm working out so that I can be physically strong, so that I can stay longer on this earth, exist for a longer time, so I can worship Allah longer. Look at the beautiful logic. Look at the beautiful sense that Islam comes with. And when I'm incorporating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my life, it's not for Allah's own good. People ask, so why do we need to do this? What's the point? Am I benefiting? What's happening? Allah doesn't need us to constantly remember Him. It's for us. Indeed, with the remembrance of Allah, hearts become content. Hearts become satisfied. Many of us today, we like this concept of satisfaction. Even celebrities. Celebrities may seem to be happy. You'll find him. He has the most money. He has the best of cars. He has the best of houses. He's living the life. He's living the luxurious life that everybody, every human being wishes to have. Yet look deep into his lifestyle, you'll find there's no happiness. Why? 
because he has neglected the fact that the same way the human being physically needs to satisfy himself, there's a spiritual dimension that if you neglect, you'll never be able to be satisfied. You'll never be able to be content. And that's why I find today, brothers and sisters, I'd like to speak about a very interesting topic. For the past previous nights, I've been speaking about individual issues pertaining to the individual. How man is the representative of Allah. How man is the only human being or one of the human beings because I established that even the bee is able to receive revelation. <laughs> but the human being is able to receive revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as revelation has been sent to the disciples of Jesus, just as revelation has been given to the mother of Moses, being non-infallibles, being non-prophets, yet still were able to receive inspiration, indicating what? Indicating that even you and I can receive revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we purify our hearts and if we break these barriers to such an extent that we see things as they really are. We see reality. Allahumma arim al haqqa haqqan fa attabi'ah wal batila batilan fa ajtaniba. Oh Allah, show me things as they are. Because in this life, we live with a veil upon our eyes. Wa kashafna anka ghita'ak fa basaruka al yawma hadid. Notice what the verse says. I've said this, but I like to repeat it because the human being has a tendency to forget. وَكَشَفْنَا عَنْكَ غِطَاءَكَ Notice what the verse says. We remove from your eyes your veil. Allah didn't put this veil. We did. Through our sins. Through our indecency. We have placed this veil in our eyes. Not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why I find Ahlul Bayt salamu alayhi alayhim when they would walk if the human being acted like an animal on this earth they'd see him as an animal. They see things as they are. When Allah says in Surah Al-Takweer, He says, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَةِ He keeps on going, what does it say? وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ And when the animals will be resurrected, I ask you a question, are animals judged? Are animals judged? Are animals questioned for what they do? No. When the verse comes forward and says, وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَةِ When the animals will be resurrected, Allah is indicating that you have human beings that act like animals in this life, will be represented as animals in the hereafter. Because on the day of judgment, my body will be gone. My body will no longer be there to satisfy my needs. This body is just a means in this world. Allah has given me the skin, has given me these flesh and bones, and put them together so that I can use it to serve Him in this world. Otherwise, when I go to the hereafter, I'm not going to be represented by my body. I'm going to be represented by the soul, by my deeds. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعَ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ The day where neither wealth or neither your family nor your children will be there to help you except مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ He who came to Allah with a submissive heart submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I may not understand the wisdom of why Allah wants me to do a certain thing but because He's the all-knowing because He's the all-wise I know placing my trust in Him will bring to me content. And Islam huwa taslim wa taslim huwa yaqeen. Notice what Islam says. What's the beautiful logic behind this baby? Go to any religion, go to any sect, go to any madhab. You won't find such a great blessing like the blessings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. You won't find anything like that. And that's why I find various non Muslims and Muslims alike not even from the followers of Ahlul Bayt, have come forward and expressed their love to Ahlul Bayt because they came with a universal message. Shafi'i, Imam Shafi'i, one of the main fathers of the sects of the Madha that we have today, he came with these lines of poetry. He says, Ya ala bayti Rasulillahi hubbukumu fardun min Allahi fil Qur'ani annakum. Look what he says. This isn't a Shia speaking. This isn't a follower of Ahlul Bayt speaking. But because the message of Ahlul Bayt has penetrated through his heart to such an extent, he has expressed their excellence. He says, O oh family of the Holy Prophet, your love, fardun min Allahi fil Qur'an annakum, has been written incumbent by Allah Himself in the Qur'an. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْفَى Rasulullah, the one who has sent as a mercy to mankind, Hasn't been sent for any other reason except for this reason. 
for you to love his family. This isn't hadith speaking, this isn't narration speaking, this is the Quran speaking, the word of Allah. I don't ask anything from you, nothing, except for you to love my family. What does it mean to love his family? Comes the question. Does it mean simply I come to this majlis, I cry for him, I leave this building, I forget him? No. Say, if you claim to love the Holy Prophet, then follow me, Allah will love you. Meaning what? There's two kinds of love. You have the emotional love, and then you have the practical love. Emotional love meaning I come for 10 nights of Muharram, what you call 40 days Muslims. Have you seen the 40 days Muslims? 30 days of Muharram, he's there. He's breaking his fast with you. Excellent, mashallah. Ramadan leaves, where is Muhammad? Where is Allah? Where is Ahlul Bayt? Out the window. Okay, Muharram comes, excellent. Wear the black, come to the mosque. Cry for Abu Abdullah al Hussein. Muharram is gone. Close the doors. Leave the mosque. Forget Hussein. Forget Zahra. Forget Zainab. It's unfortunate that we have this. We have this lack of identity. Identity crisis. One of the biggest problems our, our youth face today is this concept of identity crisis. He becomes like a chameleon. Have you seen a chameleon? Chameleon. You put him on a white surface. What color does it turn? White. You put it on a red surface. What color does it turn? Red. Put it on a black surface. It turns black. Whichever environment you throw it in, immediately adapts to that environment. We have become, not all of us of course, many of the youth have become like chameleons. He doesn't have a firm identity. Allah came and said what? كَلِمَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ كَشَجَارَةٍ طَيِّبَةٍ أَصْلُهَا ثابت. Firm. You don't swiver here and there. Like a mountain. Imam Abba Abdullah al Hussein in Kabbalah. Is there any worse tragedy that you can find in the annals of history than the Battle of Karbala? No. Imam Baba Abdullah, 30,000 are there standing in front of them. Did they affect him? No. He says, Allahumma in kana hadha yudhik, fazidni minhu. Oh Allah, if this oppression that I'm undertaking is satisfying you, then increase it upon me. The exact opposite. He says, Allah, I want more. Allahumma khudh minni hatta tarva. Allahumma take from me until you're satisfied with me. We can't have this identity crisis. Once I pick a lifestyle, I need to be firm with it. Today, my dear brothers and sisters, I'd like to speak about a topic. The past four nights, I've been speaking about topics which pertain to the individual. The next part of this theme that I have undertook in the month of Muharram is the concept of society. What's the role of society surrounding me? Am I a part of society? Do I assimilate or do I separate? A big question arises. As Muslims, does Islam come and teach you to assimilate with society, to mingle with society, or to isolate yourselves totally? One of the most fundamental criteria, or rather components, as to what makes us human beings is the fact that we're social. We're social human beings. We love to see people, we love to talk to them, we love to be around people. And notice, many networks have taken advantage of this concept that we're social beings. Facebook, MySpace, MSN, Hotmail. They've taken these networks and the fact that we've built, we've been built naturally, intrinsically, to be social human beings, they've taken this concept and built networks surrounding it so that human beings can indulge and satisfy their social needs. It's a fundamental criteria, component in every single human being. We're social, we love to see people. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes and says what? He says, you've been created differently from other human beings so that you may be social. What do I mean? People come and question the justice of Allah. They come and question the equality of Allah. They say, how is Allah all just? How is Allah equal? He has created people differently. You have somebody short, somebody tall, somebody rich, somebody poor, somebody black, somebody white. Does this question the justice of Allah? Allah came and said what? Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha wa ja'annakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila nita'afu. He says, these differences have been built in within you for that very reason, so that you may be social human beings. What do I mean? Can you imagine that if I lacked what you lacked and you had what I had, would there be any reason for me to come and introduce myself to you? There wouldn't. Allah created me differently from every, every other human being surrounding me. Why? So that I can meet Him. So that I can introduce myself to Him. Because difference is the spice to life. If everything was the same, 
There'd be no reason for me to be social human beings. Yet the problem is where? The problem is when I use my differences not to unite, but to separate. It's a big difference. Notice what the verse says. Male, female, nations, tribe. Notice, we use these four uh, groups to attack each other, to fight with each other. Notice, gender problems, racist problems, this group is better than this group, arrogance. Arrogance comes from what? The fact that I think I'm better than you. Shaitan told Allah, Ana khayrun min. I'm better than him. We use these four concepts to separate from each other. Allah says, I built you differently from other human beings, not so that you can separate, so that you can unite. It's very unfortunate that you go to some communities, you go to some societies, what do you find? You find that the cultural barriers are so clear right there in front of you. You have to marry from this culture. And if you don't marry from this culture, you're not a part of my family. There's no problem if you want to marry from some culture. But it shouldn't be the fundamental criteria for a human being to marry your daughter or to marry your son. For example, Allah said, مَنْ جَاءَكُمْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوْجُهُ If a man came to you and you accept his deen and you accept his manners, then let him get married to your son. Let him get married to your daughter. So you find differences are fundamental to unite each other. And we've been created social for various reasons. One of the fundamental and essential benefits of society is the fact that it tests us. What do I mean? Islam came and said for you to claim to be a believer, you need to mingle with society, correct? You need to intermingle with the people, you need to merge within them, and at that point, if you're able to maintain your deen, if you're able to maintain your iman, then at that point you're able to call yourself a believer. Now if you isolate yourself from society, staying in your room, maybe going up on a mountain, hmm? not meeting anybody, not facing the distractions, not facing the diseases of society, Allah says mingle with them. Face the distractions. Face the lustful desires that, des that society has to offer to you. And at that point, if you're able to maintain your deen, that's when, when it's truly impressive. أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يَفْتَنُونَ Do you claim to be a believer and you haven't been tested yet? You never know a human being only when he's tested. You won't know a single human being. He may seem the most religious person. You only know him once he's tested. Notice shaitan. Shaitan worshipped Allah for 6,000 years. How long? 6,000 years. The minute he was tested, his true colors came out. The minute he was tested. Allah told him, bow down to Adam. What did he tell him? You created me from fire. And you created him from mud. 6,000 years. Can you find any human or any person that has worshipped Allah for a longer time? No. 6,000 years. The minute Satan was tested by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, immediately his true colors arise. And that's why it's fundamental for every human being to mingle within society. Notice, society is a test for all of us. Because I mix with society, and I mingle with society. And at that point, if I'm able to maintain my deen, then that's when it's oppressive. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. That's why you find and I'd like to focus on this concept today, the concept of society, the necessity of society. Why building a good society is fundamental. Many people you'll find, the minute he's tested, his true colors emerge. Notice our youth. I'd like to focus on our youth. Youth in the back, youth on the right side, inshallah, they can pay attention. you find our youth are the backbone of society. Youth are those who stitch the fabric of society. Imam Mahdi will come. He wants to look for youth who are impressive. Why? Because being a youth, you have the opportunity to go outside and to satisfy your desires left and right. I can go to the club, I can go to my friend's house, I can go listen to music, I can go dating, because I still have that energy, I have that charisma, I have that enthusiasm. I'm still youth. Yet the older man, you can't really blame him. The energy has left. You know? There's not really much he can do. Not to offend my older people, please forgive me. Give me salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.
the youth, he has opportunity to go outside and to indulge in this haram and this indecency. The doors are wide open for him. Just go outside, it's right there. Especially living in San Diego, Allah help you. I don't know how you do it. Look at the weather. Look at the places all around you, wide open. All you need to do is have the will. And Satan is saying right there, come on, let's go, Habibi, please. He's right there, it's wide open. Yes, look at the older man, you can't really blame him. So what do I mean? Where am I getting to? Is that the youth, he has the potential and the opportunity to go and indulge in these desires. Yet once he chooses and says no, despite the fact that I have the energy, despite the fact that I have the opportunity to go and indulge in indecency, I'm going to go against my desire, come to the masjid throughout the ten nights of Muharram. That's why... There's a hadith, what does it say? It says there's nothing more beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than the tear that falls down from the eye of the youth in the midst of the night. Because he has the opportunity to go to haram. Nothing's stopping him. Yet the fact that he has sat down and said despite the fact that I can do this, I can do that, I want to sit down and remember my Lord. Yet the youth are beautiful. It's a beautiful asset to a community, the youth. But you find you only know a youth once he's tested. That's the importance of a society. Notice, for example, you have many youth, what do they say? They say, when I go to high school, despite the fact that the environment is corrupted, and despite the fact that everywhere around me is haram, I'm going to maintain my iman. I'm still going to go to the masjid. I'm still going to pray. I'm still going to do dua. I'm a strong believer. Okay, let's see, brother. He goes to the first day. He goes to school. Mrs. Blondie walks right by him. 50% his willpower goes down. 50%. Why? Because he's tested. And it's vital for a human being to be able to test himself and still claim to be a mu'min. Number one, society tests us. Society tests the human being. Number two, society is a preservation to the morals and lessons of the history and of the people that came before us. What do I mean? You find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with a divine manual. Divine manual. We're not speaking about a human. We're not speaking about a highly regarded official. No. We're speaking about Allah. Allah has brought down to us a manual, this Holy Quran, to teach us how to live our lives. To teach us how to be civilized human beings. This Quran. What is this Quran? What is this Quran? This Quran is a summarized history Summarized lesson of 124,000 prophets who came before me. All these examples, all these lessons have been summarized into a few pages. I ask you, can we ask anything more from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a little book, this holy Quran, that has shook the foundations of every human being, which has mind-boggled every human being, the scientists, the the, the fundamentalists, the human beings, the smart ones, the dumb ones, this Qur'an has shook their foundations. Because despite the fact that the Qur'an came down 1400 years ago, read it today, is that it's as if it was set down yesterday. It's amazing, the whole Qur'an. And I mentioned how Charles, how, um, what's his name? How uh, one of the most uh, revered... Uh, yeah, uh, Bernard Shaw. Bernard Shaw, what does he say? He comes forward and says, I revere this man whose name is Muhammad. Why? Because his religion is the only religion that seems to be applic applicable to every time and age. Every time and age, despite the fact it came down thousands of years ago. By the way, when we learn in our schools that Islam is the youngest religion, raise your hand and say, excuse me, Islam is the original religion. It's a big misconception that we have today in our, in our, in our, uh, in our schools, in our education boards. It's very, it's very unfortunate. They'll teach you that Islam is the youngest religion. Christianity was just an incomplete version of Islam. Judaism was just an incomplete version of Islam. Yet when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came, he didn't introduce a new religion. He just completed the religion that Musa and Isa came with. When he was standing there in Ghadir Khum, and he raised the hand of Ali ibn Abi Talib. He said, Man kuntu mawla. First he told him, Alastu awla bin mu'minina min anfusihim. Do I not have more authority over you than you have over yourself? They said, yes. Bala ya Rasulullah. He continued and said, 
من كنت مولاه فهذا علي مولاه اللهم والي من والاه وعادي من عاداه وانصر من نصره واخذل من خذله The verse came down to all the Prophet. Ya ayyuhal rasulu balagh ma unzila ilayka man rabbik. Wa in lam taf'al fa ma balaghta risalata. Look at the importance. Look at the equivalence of not appointing Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib as an imam. It's equivalent to as if the Holy Prophet didn't even begin his message. This is Quran speaking, not hadith. بلغ ما أنزل إليك من ربك وإن لم تفعل فما بلغت رسالته. So when I come on this pulpit or when any follower of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen or the school of Ahlul Bayt comes and brags with his pride because he's a follower of Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen, it's not simply love for individual. No, it's the fact that through this man Islam was completed. Musa alayhi salam came, wasn't able to complete Islam. Jesus alayhi salam came. Was it able to complete Islam? Muhammad himself came. He completed it, but through the wilaya of Imam Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. 124,000 prophets were sent to mankind. None of them had the audacity or had the excellence to complete Islam except when Imam Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam came. So when the Holy Prophet rose the hand of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he wasn't completing Islam. He was completing the mission of Musa. He was completing the mission of, Joseph, of, of Jesus. He was completing the mission of Ibrahim. And this is the religion that you and I have today. It's an encapsulated version of all the examples, of all the lessons that have been sent to mankind. And this is no other than Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. So I mentioned how society is a preservation to the moral teachings and the lessons of, the, of Islam. What do I mean? is that society has been able to preserve for us the morals and lessons that have been sent to us. Notice what the whole Qur'an says. The Qur'an came and summarized the examples and the lessons that the Prophet came before it with. When I want to make, for example, a scientific law, hmm, what do I do? For example, I want to prove that atoms expand under heat. I perform this experiment tens of times, hundreds of times, and, which, and when each experiment comes up with the same results, I set it as a law. Whenever atoms are exposed under heat, they expand. Islam and history have proved for us that the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are as firm as the scientific laws. When Allah says two times two, or when math comes and says two times two equals four, this is a law. You can't mess around with it. Because whenever you have two, two stuff of something and something else, you combine it, it becomes four. Allah in the Holy Quran has told us what? He told you there will never be a liar who will be successful in this world. Allah says, travel my earth. You won't find any liar that was successful. Okay, Allah has said Allah in the Holy Quran. Now prove it. Society has proved it for us. History has proved it for us. When for example a man like Fir'aun, go through history. Go through the books of Tariq. You won't find a more arrogant man than Fir'aun. To the extent that he says, Ya Haman, ibni li sarhan, la'alli attali'u ila ilahi Musa, wa inni adhunnuhu min al-kathbeen. Look at the arrogance. He says, Ana rabbukum al-a'la. I am your highest lord. He tells his, his, his supporter, or his successor, Haman, he says, Ya Haman, build me a ladder. Why do you want a ladder of Fir'aun? So I can climb this ladder and I can see the Lord of Musa. I think he's a liar. Who's he speaking? Fir'aun alayhi salam. Fir'aun belied the nation for thousands, for hundreds of years, telling them that I am your Lord. Allah proved it through, so through society that a liar will never be successful. Despite the physical material that he had, despite the support that he had from the people surrounding him, because he was a liar, Allah has allowed death to take him the most humiliating ways. Notice Musa alayhi salam. He's running away from Fir'aun. He splits the sea. Fir'aun is there to chase him. The water closes, the sea closes. And Musa and, and Fir'aun and Fir'aun alayhi alayhi, he drowns there with humility. He's saying, please help me. Allah tells him, too late. I gave you an opportunity. You were a liar. And my laws are firm. Fir'aun alayhi salam. Look at Yazid. The cousin. The student of Fir'aun, Yazid. Yazid belied the message of Al Muhammad for, for tens of years. He belied them. 
He said, you're telling me that prophecy and imama will be encompassed in the same family? No way. لعبت هاشم بالملك فلا خبر جاء ولا وحي نزل. He said Hashim has played with this with this power. They're taking advantage of us. Neither did revelation come down. Neither did any news from the sky come down. They're lying. How did Yazid end up? Go to the shrine of Yazid if you can find it. Go, go and visit it. Allah says he was a liar. I have set this as a firm law. You lied. It's my job to take you away. Success is far away from you, like from the sky and the earth. Because you're a liar. It's a firm law. Society have put it for us. Take Saddam for example. Saddam belied the nation for 35 years. How long? 35 years. He dictated the nation. He oppressed the nation. How did he end up? I mentioned this in my first, in my first night. That time is a revealer. How did Saddam end up? He ended up in a hole looking like Santa Claus. He ended up like Santa Claus. Why? Because the fact that he belied the nation for 35 years. Allah said, my laws are firm and I will establish it through, through your failure. So you find that society have proved for us that the lessons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came with are set. They're firm. Give me a salat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. They're firm. You can't mess around with them. And that's why proving to us and establishing that society has proved to us that the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are firm, we need to take them into consideration and learn from the past. Learn from the past. This is vital. If you don't want to fall into the same mistake as those fall in, those who came before you, what do you do? You learn from the examples that came before you. Imam, Imam Al-Muttaqeen, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib what does he say? He says, I studied those, he tells Imam Al-Hasan in the letter, he tells him, Learn from those who came before you. He says, I took the people of the past into such sincere consideration. And I studied their remains. And I studied how they lived to such an extent that it was as if I lived with them. And I was there through every transaction that they made. Imam Mir Muminin. He says, I studied their life. I studied their remains. And it was as if I was there living with them. Until I learned that what action led to success and which action led to failure. We learn from the people that came before us. We learn from those who came before us. Because those who fell in the same mistake, those who fell in the mistake, I don't want to fall in the same mistake. So what do I do? I learn from those who came before me. You use them as a sense of, of precaution. You learn from them. You learn of the size that came before you. And that's why you find that building a good society is fundamental in every human being's life. Because every human being is affected by the society that he's put in. Every human being. Notice, one of the first things we ask when we want to do something, what do we think? We say, what will the people think? What will my friends say? Will I still be accepted by society? Will the people still enjoy me? Will they still be pleased with me? Now this isn't a problem. It's not necessarily something bad. If I, if, I, if I care about what other people say. But if society, please pay attention to this point. If society was a society that normalized the abnormal, then what I am doing, which I think is right, in reality is leading me towards my destruction. What do I mean? Society is supposed to be like a brother to you. Al-mu'min mar'ata akhihi al-mu'min. What does the hadith say? It says... A mu'min is like a mirror to his fellow mu'min. When I look in a mirror, for example, my hair doesn't look so good. The mirror doesn't lie to me. It tells me your hair doesn't look good. It shows me things as they are. When I have an injury, or when I'm not looking good, and I look in the mirror, it, it shows to me clearly that you're not looking good. Society sometimes does the opposite. Society sometimes, you're doing something bad, yet they're there supporting you. You're doing something good, yet the majority is against you. It's very unfortunate that you have, when you have a family member who wants to go to Hawza, you find the majority are there against him. What do you need with Hawza? Hawza is for the poor people. Hawza is for those who have no future. Why do you want to go there? Yet when you have a lady who wants to take off her hijab, no one says anything. This is a problem. Society, besides becoming a mirror, becomes what? Comes the exact opposite. It leads you to destruction. كنتم خير أمة أخرجت للناس تأمرون بالمعروف 
Allah speaks about the nation that Rasulullah reformed. He says, you are the best of nations. Why? Because you showed things as they really truly are. You command good and you prevent evil. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So you find society is fundamental, no doubt. Yet if society normalizes the abnormal, this is where it becomes indeed a problem. And I ask you a question, who is it to blame when our youth don't know how to pray? Going back to society, if society hasn't done their job, who is to blame when our youth don't know how to do a look correctly? It's very unfortunate when you find our youth sitting there, 18, 19, 20 years old, that you find flaws left and right in his salah. You find flaws left and right in his wudu. Who is to blame? I ask you a question. If not society, who else is there to blame? It was very beautiful. Today I came in the morning to this Sunday school. And I seen little, little people, 8 years old, 9 years old, 10 years old, standing quietly in salah. No one saying a word. Everybody standing there in a the firm line. Sometimes even our olders can't stand in a firm line just as they were. You find he's there standing. Quietly praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing more beautiful than youth who has been able to maintain his iman. When I came to Sunday school, I'll be very honest with you, I was impressed. I was satisfied. Because when you see youth who are able to discipline themselves, like I said, despite the fact he has the opportunity to go outside and indulge in haram, he comes to the Sunday school, 10 o'clock a.m. in the morning, to show his love, to show his, his enthusiasm and his interest to learn about deen. It's fundamental. And that's why I find when you live in a corrupt society, it normalizes the abnormal. You need to have a society that shows you things as they truly are. Now you may ask, I live in a corrupt society. Many people ask this question. They say, I live in a bad society. What can I do? Islam comes and says you have two options. Either you revolt against the corruption. What do I mean by revolt? You don't, you don't carry an army, no. You revolt against the corruption. How? Through trying to strive for the betterment of society. Allah has given every single human being a potential. Allah has given you a skill. Allah has given you a skill. People think serving Islam is just through speaking. No, speaking is the last option. Action is what Allah wants. Allah has given every human being a skill. This skill that I have been given, I come to this mosque or I come to my center and I reflect this potential and skill that I have been given by serving my community. Number one, if you find <clears throat> that society is corrupt, you try to change it for the better. Yet what if on the other hand, you find that society is too strong and too corrupt and you're too weak and oppressed and you find you have to submit to the corruption. Is this an option? Is this an option for me to submit? The people in Mecca came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The people came to the Holy Prophet and they told him, Ya Rasulullah, we have become mushrikeen. I told them why? He told them because, what did they tell him? They told him because society was too strong and we're weak, we're a minority. How do you expect us to not become disbelievers? Society won't accept us and it's too, we're too weak, we're oppressed, we can't do anything about it. Allah immediately sent down this verse. Was my earth not spacious enough for you to migrate? Was my earth not spacious enough for you to migrate? If I'm living in a corrupt society, what do I do? Do I submit to the corruption? No. Number one, I strive for the betterment of society. Number two, if I can't do that, if I find myself too weak and oppressed to change the corruption, that's in society, I leave it. I leave it. I don't submit to it. Allah has created the earth, unbelievably vast earth. For me to come to Allah on the day of judgment, oh, well, Allah, I had to do this. I couldn't wear hijab, for example, or I wasn't able to maintain my deen. Because society was too strong, Allah says, you could have migrated. What's the problem? You could have left the corruption and went to another community. I'll give you a simple example. When I used to go to high school, no doubt high school is a corrupt environment. High school, left and right, haram, indecency, and it'll affect you whether you like it or not. If you're not influencing them, there's only two options. Either you're influencing society or society is influencing you. So when I was in high school, throughout my last years, Many, many, many years ago, when I used to go to high school, I'm joking, just last year. <laughs> so when I went to high school, what happened? My father noticed that it began to affect me. When I see a haram all around me, I go home, 
some of that filth is going to stick to my clothes. And it's going to be carried out in my daily lifestyle. You begin to miss Fajr before you know it. Ali, wake up! Okay, okay, Dad. Ten minutes later. Ali, Salah! Do you want to wake up? Okay, I get up. You know, I, I was very smart. I'll be very honest with you. I will stand by the bed, I say Allahu Akbar, and I'll go back to sleep. <laughs> I'll be very honest with you. There's nothing to be ashamed of. So you find high school began to affect me. What did my dad do? Immediately, he took me out of that corrupt environment and he put me in another one. He put me in homeschool. Why? Because if I'm not able to maintain my iman, if I'm not able to maintain my deen, Allah says, get out of that environment. What's the issue? My earth is spacious enough. So number one, you begin to leave that environment. And that's why you have two kinds of people. You have one human being who is in shape by the environment. What do I mean? Like a chameleon, like I said, you put him in this environment, he's black. In this environment, he's white. You find them, they all dress the same. They all look the same. They all talk the same. Hey, yo, boy, what's going on? You know, they all talk the same. You find it, it's very obvious. It's obvious in front of you. He's a product of society. You can point it out, sticking out like a sore thumb. This guy is a product of society. He's dressing like them. His hat is to the side, his hair is spiked up, he's trying to have that groove, you know when you walk, you know, how the shoulder bumps up left and right, he tries to do it, you can't blame him, because he's a product of society. So you have two kinds of people, one who's in shape by the environment, and then you have another human being who knows, he in shapes the environment, environment is in shape by him. What do I mean? Take the Holy Prophet for example. The Holy Prophet lived in the midst of the era of ignorance. To the extent that they would, they would bury the infant alive. They would bury the infant alive. Can you get any more ignorant than that? Why are you doing this? Oh, well, I don't like females. Why don't I like females? No explanation. What was the point? The point is they would bury female girls alive. Rasulullah could have came and assimilated to that lifestyle and could have buried his, his own daughter alive too. But what did he do? He came and he reformed society. He transformed them from the worst of societies to the best. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat nas. The best of nations, inshallah, I'll be done very soon. The best of nations. He reformed it to the best of nations. Why? Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat nas. Ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna anil munkar. The worst. He transformed it to the best. That's why I find Michael Hart. Michael Hart is the writer, the author of this book by the name of the 100, the most influential individuals in history. This list has the greatest people you'll find in history. People like Jesus, people like Moses, people like St. Paul, people like, for example, Newton, Einstein, Aristotle, great people. Do you know who he placed as number one? The Holy Prophet. Why? They came and asked him. They told him, Michael, you have great people, unbelievably great people, people who have done so much for society and have affected history to such an extent. Why did he place the Holy Prophet as number one? Do you know what he told them? He told them the Holy Prophet was a man who had no support surrounding him. Aristotle had people around him supporting him. Jesus had his people there helping him. Jesus had 12 disciples. Moses had the 12 sons of Jacob. When the Holy Prophet came, what did he do? He transformed the worst of societies to the best. Because he was able to shape environment. Environment didn't shape him. And there's a big difference. And that's why once establishing the importance of a society, what do you find? You find that many people sacrifice the good of society for their own benefit. And this is a big problem. Notice the economy. The economy is in the worst of situations. Worst. Why? Because you find that the human being, government official, whoever he is, he'll be greedy. He'll say, okay, well, I'm in a good situation. Financially, I'm stable. Why do I care if the gas prices skyrocket? Why do I care if this is happening? I'm financially set. Whereas Imam al muttaqin Ali ibn Abi Talib came and said what? Notice, after the death of the second caliph, Umar ibn al-Khattab, a six-man council was made. A council which constituted, for example, Talha ibn Zubair and Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. And then you had Umar ibn Affan. You had all of these people in it. And then you had Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, six-man council. Notice what happened. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was set as the leader of that council. He came to Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen. What did he tell him? He told him, Imam, for three days, we haven't told the people who's going to become Khalifa after the second caliph. Do you want to become Khalifa? He said, of course I do. I can lead the nation to the best. 
He told him under one condition. You use the sunnah of Allah and his prophet and the sunnah of the second caliph. The first two caliphs that came before you. Now when we come as prophets, our job isn't to, for example, abuse a certain khalifa. That's not our job. Islam tells us to respect everyone even if he's the utmost kafir. It doesn't matter. Yet what we do, the, the, the school of Al-Muhammad, it taught you to come on these pulpits and to state the facts. The sixth man council was made. They come to Imam Al-Muttaqeen. They tell him, do you want to become Khalifa? He says, yes. He tells them, okay, under one condition, you follow the sin of Allah's Prophet and the two caliphs that came before you. He told them, no way. With all due respect, I am an Imam of the time. I have to follow the sunnah of Allah and His Prophet. So then they go to they go to uh, Uthman, they told him, Uthman, would you want to become the Khalifa after the death of Umar? What does he say? He says, of course, he takes the Khalifa. They go to Imam Ibn Mu'min, notice what Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib says, back to the concept of how you sacrifice your own good for the good of society. He says, I can revolt against all of you right now. Notice Imam Ali ibn Abi look, look at his logic. He doesn't care about himself. He says, this Khalifa equivalent to me is like the water under the nose of the gate, of the goat. Has seen the goat? Has what? Is it worth anything? No. He says, this is what Khalaf is worth to me. He came and said what? He said, I could revolt against you. I could at this moment uh, announce a war. What does he say? He says, but for the sake of society, I will assimilate with you and I'll accept your law. Notice Imam al Mu'mineen. And that's why you find the Holy Prophet, once that Jibra'il came to him, he told Jibra'il, go and take the soul of the son of the Holy Prophet Qasim. Notice how we say Awal Qasim. The Holy Prophet, his son was Qasim. So the angel came to the Holy Prophet. He told him, Ya Rasulullah, and I concluded this, Ya Rasulullah, Allah has sent me and informed you to take the soul of your son Qasim. But he gave you an alternative. Either he takes the soul of Qasim or he takes the soul of Aba Abdullah Hussein. Notice how the Holy Prophet sacrificed his desires for the desires of the people around him. He told him, take the soul of Qasim. Told him, Jibra'il asked him, what do you mean, Ya Rasulullah? This is your son. You've preferred your son over your grandson. What's going on? He's closer to you. He told him, if Qasim is taken, then I will be sad. But if Abu Abdullah al Hussein is taken, then my whole family will be grievous by it. Fatim will be there crying. Al Hassan will be there crying. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib will be there crying. Take Qasim. He sacrificed it for the sake of the people surrounding him. Let us not be products of society, but ones who would shape it. And that's why when coming on a night like this, the night of Ali ibn Akbar, you find there is no one who sacrificed himself more than Ali ibn Akbar on the 10th of Muharram. This young man, young man, he could have had the desires of the world left and right. He was a beautiful young man. When Abu Abdullah al Hussein was there, he says, Hal min yansuruna. Is there anybody there to help me? What happens? Ali Akbar comes to him and tells him, Ya Abu Abdullah, would you give me the permission to go and fight for your sake? Abu Abdullah cries. Do you know why he cries? Because Ali al Akbar, Ali al Akbar alayhi salam, resembled the Prophet to such an extent that when they would miss Rasulullah, they would look at the face of Ali al Akbar alayhi salam. So when Abu Abdullah al Hussein allowed Ali al Akbar to go to the battlefield, what did he say? He said, Allahumma shahid. Allahumma ashhid. Bi anni. Kharajtu ila al qawm. Ila haula. Ghulaman ashbah al nas. Bi rasulillahi mantan khulqan wa khalqa. He says, O oh people, O oh Allah witness that I have sent to the people the one who resembles the Holy Prophet most, not only in his looks, but his actions and in his manners as well. Ali al-Akbar alayhi salam Like a brave warrior begins to walk towards the battlefield. What does he shout? He shouts, Ana Ali ibn al-Hussein ibn Ali Nahnu wa baytillah awlaad al-Nabi He says, I am Ali, the son of Abu Abdullah al-Husayn, the 
of Ali ibn Abi Talib, I have come on to this battlefield to protect my father Hussein. Why? Because he understood that by fighting the hands of Allah, he would be in shaping the environment and he would be affecting society. And the proof is what? Until today, 1400 years later, will he remember Ali ibn Akbar alayhi salam? He shouts, Ana Ali. He fights and he fights. But the mother of Ali, listen to this line. Wallah, it should break the heart of every Mullah Muali tonight. The mother of Ali al-Akbar was named Layla. Layla didn't have the heart to look at Ali al-Akbar fight directly. What would she do? Aba Abdullah and Hussein would stand by the tent. Layla would look at the face of Aba Abdullah. And if he's smiling, she knows that he's doing good. But if he begins to frown, she knows that Ali al-Akbar is in a bad situation. Layla is looking at the face of Aba Abdullah and Hussein. As she sees his face turn pale, she tells him, Ya Abna Rasulullah, oh Aba Abdullah, is my son Ali Akbar in a good situation? He tells her, Yes, oh Layla. But there is a man that I fear could kill him coming his way. Hey, what does he tell her? He says, Oh Layla, go back in the tent and pray to Allah for your son to come back. For the dua of the mother is never left unanswered. Those mothers are out there. Pray for your sons. Allah says, The mother. Dua is never left unanswered. What does she do? She goes back in her tent and she raises her hands to the sky. What does she shout? She says, Allahumma bi ghurbat al Hussein. Allahumma bi atash al Hussein. Allahumma ya rad Yusuf li aqub rudli waladi Ali. She says, Oh Allah, by the thirst of Abba Abdullah. Oh Allah. Who returned Yusuf to his father Yaqub? Return my son Ali al Akbar to me. Ali al Akbar finishes the people off. He comes back to his father Aba Abdullah al Hussein. He tells him, Aba Ya Hussein, is there any water for me to drink? The thirst is killing me. Oh Aba Abdullah, my heart has been cut into pieces. I need some water to cool my heart down. He tells him, Oh Ali, my tongue is drier than yours. I am thirstier than you. Ali al Akbar goes back. After he farewells his mother, he begins to fight like a lion. He begins to fight bravely until Ali al Akbar alayhi salam is hit. Ali al Akbar falls on to the ground. When Abba Abdullah hears the voice of his son Ali, he hears him shout, Assalamu alaik, ya abata. Notice this line, Wallah, it breaks my heart. Abba Abdullah and Hussein comes to Ali Akbar. He finds Ali Akbar one moment smiling, one moment he's crying. He tells him, Oh Ali, why do I find you between these two emotions? One moment you're crying, one moment you're laughing. Listen to this line. He tells him, When I look to my left side, I see Rasulullah welcoming me in paradise with a cup of water. That if I drink, I will never be thirsty after it. But when I look to my right side, I see my grandmother Fatima alayhi salam. She looks at my injuries and she looks at your face and she begins to hurt herself heavily, crying. Assalamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Notice what Aba Abdullah al-Hussein does. He takes Ali al-Akbar. He's cut into pieces. They cut him into pieces. Allahu Akbar. He takes him back to the tent. But Fatima alayhi salam was still there. Fatima law khilti al-Hussein mujaddala. وقد مات عطشانا بشط فرايتي اذا للطمت الخد فاطم عنده واجريت دمع العين بالوجنات اللهم تقبلنا هذا القليل اللهم نسالك بعطش الحسين وبغربه الحسين الا قضيت لنا حوائجنا يا الله والله we ask you by Aba Abdullah and by the one who represented Rasulullah through his looks and through his actions to accept our prayers on this night. والاستجابة الدعوة دفع البلاء ونسأل سورة المباركة الفاتحة before it the loudest of salawat على محمد وآل محمد.